Well, it's almost that time of year again, and that means we can truly start to get excited about the festivities to come. Decorating the Christmas tree, seeing friends and family for the first time in ages, and of course, revisiting classic Yuletide movies. In this episode, we're getting all selfish and cynical with 1988 Scrooged, a retelling of the classic Charles Dickens novel, A Christmas Carol, that focuses on Bill Murray's grumpy TV executive who's visited by the ghosts of Christmas past in order to restore his long gone Christmas spirit. That was a good one. It's loud, it's cartoonish, and it's certainly misanthropic, but is it worth watching again this Christmas time? Thanks, boys. Get the nurse. Let's find out on Revisited. Although Scrooge has now become a holiday stable and a classic in its own right over the festive season, the production was not without its controversies, and of course those dreaded creative differences. Released in 1988 and filmed on a budget of $32 million, the movie had excellent direction pedigree and new Hollywood legend Richard Donner, who had just unleashed the awesome Lethal Weapon the year before. That movie redefined the buddy cop genre, and Paramount were hoping to recapture some of the magic left over from that production. You really are crazy. However, what they weren't banking on was a star fresh from a break from bus and ghosts who ended up butting heads with a former Superman director. And if you need a break from bus and ghosts, why don't you subscribe to our Joe Blow Originals channel and tell your pals who may also like this sort of content. Bill Murray had considered himself to be rusty after taking a break from acting after describing the phenomenon that Ghostbusters became as what he felt would be the biggest success of his career. He had also been stung by the relative failure of 1984's The Razor's Edge and that radioactive experience as he described it also put the brakes on his love of being in front of the camera. However, his return in Scrooge was not exactly the smoothest transition back to Hollywood life, and aside from issues he had with the script, the production was also rife with conflict between Murray and Soup's Helma Donna. In an interview with Roger Ebert from 1990, Murray said that Scrooge could have been a really, really great movie. The script was good, but he kept telling me to do things louder, louder, louder. I think he was deaf. He also said that he and Donna shared a vastly different vision for the film that Scrooge would eventually become, and that only one take in the movie ultimately was his. He also found the filming conditions difficult and the fake snow used on the set had allegedly made him cough up blood, leading him to subsequently describe his experience in retrospect. He said, That's a tough one. I still have trouble talking about Scrooge, and describes working on a dusty, smelly and smoky set. Murray Shaw sure comes across as being massively disappointed in the movie and also felt enormous pressure being the lead actor and the only real name attached to the project, with his previous mammoth success in being slime for a living meant he was part of an acting ensemble. He slimed me. That's great! So far then, it seems that life on Scrooge was a tad Bahama for all involved. Well, Richard Donner looked back on his time helming the movie and working with Murray in more of a positive light. They had never worked together before, but met up for drinks before Murray signed on for the project, and the pair actually got along pretty well. He describes their working relationship and Murray as superbly creative, but occasionally difficult, as difficult as any actor and also that his penchant for ad-libbing lines on set was new to the director, having never really experienced an actor of his ilk before. Adding that, you don't direct Murray, you pull him back. However, Murray also noted in his interview with Roger Ebert that he clashed with Donna every single minute of the day, and that the pace in which he raced through production made the actor feel that filming the movie was like doing a live movie. Production issues aside, however, Scrooge is still one of the most televised movies during Christmas, and sometimes a little conflict on set can lead to the best movies being made. The inspiration for Scrooge, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, recounts the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, an elderly miser who's visited by the ghost of his former business partner Jacob Marley, and the spirits of Christmas past, present and yet to come. After their visit, Scrooge is transformed into a kinder, gentler man. There have since been countless incarnations of Dickens' famous tale, but one element that attracted Bill Murray to Paramount's reimagining was the opportunity to bring some humour to the story. And I mean, after all, this was coming from the guy who had us all in stitches in Ghostbusters by simply flirting with an attractive lady while electrocuting some poor sod at the same time. Comedy is Murray's thing, but could he bring that talent to Scrooge while also being a believable asshole at the same time? Murray plays grumpy television executive Frank Cross, whose selfish persona and cynical outlook on life matches that of Ebenezer Scrooge well. Oh my gosh, does that suck? And like the original character, he is also visited by a succession of ghosts on Christmas Eve, with a not so easy task of helping him snap out of his mean spirited ways to regain his non existent Christmas spirit. The movie also stars Karen Allen, whose feisty and formidable turn in 1981's Raiders of the Lost Ark lit that movie up like a New Year's Eve firework, and she brings some much needed warmth, life, and more dimension to the role of Claire Phillips, a hero of the story that ultimately helps to save the soul of Murray's Frank Cross. Joining her on the acting roster was also John Forsyth as Lou Hayward, Police Academy's Scatshot Oddball, Wait a minute! I am the police! Bobcat Goldthwaite as Elliot Loudermilk, 
Carol Kane as a ghost of Christmas present, Robert Mitchum as Preston Rhinelander, Michael J. Pollard as Herman, and Alfred Woodard as Grace Cooley. It's an excellent ensemble and helps to bring this alternative take on Charles Dickens' tale to life, even if Murray did feel like he carried the acting burden of the movie on his own broad shoulders. The movie starts with Frank Cross, a television executive for IBC, pushing for the network to produce a lavish live take on a Christmas carol to be shown on Christmas Eve, which would make the staff involved work over the holiday season. In a power-hungry, egotistical move, he fires those who disagree with him, sends cheap Christmas gifts to people on his list while sucking up to the most influential people he knows by splashing out on expensive gifts for them. So far, pretty bar humbug, right? Despite his unkindness and apparent lack of empathy for those around him, Frank's boss Preston Rhinelander notices how much stress the production is placing on him and brings in Bryce Cummins, who is secretly after Frank's job, to help out. In the midst of Frank's turmoil, he's visited by the ghost of his former mentor, Lou Hayward, who was also a complete misery and who had died of a heart attack seven years ago. In order to help Frank avoid the same untimely fate as him, he informs Frank that he'll be visited by three more ghosts over the next day and even calls up Karen Allen's Claire Phillips, Frank's former love, to come to his aid. However, he probably lost one too many drinking contests with her and Frank rudely has no time for her and she returns to the homeless shelter where she works. As promised, Frank is subsequently visited by the three ghosts. In the first one, the ghost of Christmas past, played by David Janssen, appears as rehearsal star as a manic taxi driver. The ghost shows Frank his past and how after his parents split up, he found comfort in the world of TV, and also how he let his career get in the way of his relationship with Claire. This prompts Frank to seek Claire out to make amends, but can't help but return to his unsociable and unsympathetic ways, showing his contempt for a homeless man called Herman, as well as the rest of the shelter workers. Another wake-up call arrives with the introduction of the ethereal ghost of Christmas present, who smacks Frank around a bit before taking him to his assistant Grace's apartment to see her struggling to support her large family, and in particular her younger son Calvin, who has been mute since witnessing the death of his father. The ghost then takes Frank to his brother James's house, who sticks up for his sibling despite Frank's insistence on not taking part in any Christmas celebrations. A toast to my brother Frank. I wish he was here. Were, Goofy and giving them cheap and thoughtful gifts. Eventually, the ghost of Christmas present leaves Frank under a sidewalk where he finds the dead body of Herman, who he insulted at the homeless shelter where Frank's former girlfriend Claire works. This sends Frank into a downward spiral, and after crashing onto the set of the production, he eventually returns to his office where he's faced with a vengeful Elliot. Money! I'm home! And also the final apparition, the Grim Reaper-like ghost of Christmas future, who appears and proceeds to show him just how grim his future will be if he doesn't change his miser-like ways. First by showing him Grace his now institutionalised son Calvin, then by showing Frank his own cremation ceremony where only his brother James and his wife Wendy have turned up to bid him farewell. Just as Frank is about to be incinerated, he breaks out a changed man and bumps into Elliot again and offers the bemused man a high-level executive position at the TV network. And, as anybody who knows the original story, the movie he also ends on a feel-good redemptive note with Frank breaking into the live show's broadcast to apologise to Grace, James and also the rest of the cast and crew before making a passionate plea for Claire to come back to him. And as we mentioned earlier in this video, Scrooge has now become a festive go-to movie for families the world over and revisiting the film itself, its production and also its casting, you can see why. It may have been marred by production issues and fallouts between star and director but it is ultimately heartening in a loopy yuletide kind of way. Over the Christmas period, there are many movies that are staples for the holidays that tick the box for every demographic. It's a Wonderful Life or A Christmas Story for the Nostalgics, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or The Grinch for the Kids, A Nightmare Before Christmas for the edgier teens, and Die Hard for those in need of an adrenaline action fueled Christmas kick. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. Scrooge chucks all of this, nostalgia, cartoonish violence, sloppy sentimentality, and also even Spielbergian horror imagery that may be enough to spook children into a very noisy and messy blender. It also has a very 1980s shtick to one of its themes of television rotten our brains, which is probably quite an outdated concept nowadays. Or at least it would be if the family members you watch this movie with over the holidays aren't glued to their mobile phones half the time. Bill Murray's performance as Frank Cross is so unlikable throughout much of the film's 1 hour and 40 minutes runtime that once his redemption eventually comes, it is prolonged and very loud to ensure it is entirely believable. The whole point of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol was that Scrooge is a complete asshole until the very moment he's 
stops being one, and the obligatory redemptive speech and forgiveness. In the case of Scrooge, we're lucky that the protagonist is played by Bill Murray, as in anybody else's hands, his redemption may not be that believable. Scrooge arrived four years after his charming goofball turn in Ghostbusters, five years before his also charmingly goofball turn in Groundhog Day, and also quite a few years north of his later roles, playing slightly less goofball and more soulfully charming roles for the likes of Sofia Coppola and Wes Anderson. Ultimately though, Scrooge works because of Bill Murray's intensity in the role. Just watch that prolonged redemptive speech and his cries of WHAT ARE YOU DOING WATCHING TELEVISION? He thunders, and by the time he's bellowing about how YOU'LL WANT IT EVERY DAY OF YOUR LIFE AND IT CAN HAPPEN TO YOU it's conceivable that this scene will never end, but it is truly wonderful and at the same time, whatever the opposite of wonderful is as well. Made on a budget of around $32 million, the movie brought in $18.6 million during its Thanksgiving extended opening weekend in the United States alone at 1,262 theatres and made just over $100 million worldwide. The critical response to the film was mixed, with Roger Ebert calling it one of the most disquieting, unsettling films to come along in quite some time, while Empire called it a slick and cynical update of Dickinson's tale, but that it's only funny when Murray's character is being a complete bastard, while others were mixing their appraisal of Murray's vitriolic performance. Whatever your view of the movie is, there's no denying it has the longevity to continue to be a loud and messy festive treat for everyone who wants an alternative take on a classic festive feel. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Originals YouTube channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support. Merry Christmas from us all here at Joe Blow.